Rick, uh, witnesses for being with us today. We know that uh, you're all busy people, and we know that you've taken time out from not only busy but very important schedules, and we're honored to have all of you here. Mr. Ulrich, uh, I, look, I really look forward to hearing your testimony as well as all the others. So we'll start with you. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, my name is Lars Ulrich. I was born in Denmark. In 1980, as a teenager, my parents and I came to America. I started a band named Metallica in 1981 with my best friend James Hetfield. By 1983, we had released our first record, and by 1985, we were no longer living below the poverty line. Since then, we've been very fortunate to achieve a great deal, great level of success in the music business throughout the world. It's the classic American dream come true. I'm very honored to be here in this country, and I'm very honored to appear in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Earlier this year, while completing work on a song for the movie Mission Impossible 2, we were startled to hear reports that five or six versions of our work in progress were already being played on some U.S. radio stations. We traced the source of this leak to a corporation called Napster. Additionally, we learned that all our previously recorded copyright songs were, via Napster, available for anyone around the world to download from the internet in a digital format known as MP3. In fact, in a 48-hour period where we monitored Napster, over 300,000 users made 1.4 million free downloads of Metallica's music. Napster hijacked our music without asking. They never sought our permission. Our catalog of music simply became available for free downloads on the Napster system. I do not have a problem with any artist voluntarily distributing his or her songs through any means that artist so chooses. But just like a carpenter who crafts a table gets to decide whether he wants to keep it, sell it, or give it away, shouldn't we have the same options? We should decide what happens to our music, not a company with no rights in our recordings, which has never invested a penny in our music or had anything to do with its creation. The choice has been taken away from us. With Napster, every song by every artist is available for download at no cost, and of course with no payment to the artist, the songwriter, or the copyright holder. If you're not fortunate enough to own a computer, there's only one way to assemble a music collection, the equivalent of a Napster user. Theft. Walk into a record store, grab what you want, and walk out. The difference is that the familiar phrase, files done, is now replaced by another familiar phrase, you're under arrest. Since what I do is make music, let's talk about the recording artist for a moment. When Metallica makes an album, we spend many months and many hundreds of thousands of our own dollars writing and recording. We typically employ a record producer, recording engineers, programmers, assistants, and occasionally other musicians. We rent time for months at recording studios which are owned by small businessmen who have risked their own capital to buy, maintain, and constantly upgrade very expensive equipment and facilities. Our record releases are supported by hundreds of record companies, employees, and provide programming for numerous radio and television stations. Add it all up and you have an industry with many jobs, a few glamorous ones like ours, and lots more covering all levels of the pay scale and providing wages which support families and could contribute to our economy. Remember, too, that my band Metallica is fortunate enough to make a great living from what we do. Most artists are barely earning a decent wage and need every source of revenue available to scrape by. Also keep in mind that the primary source of income for most songwriters is from the sale of records. Every time a Napster enthusiast downloads a song, it takes money from the pockets of all these members of the creative community. It is clear then that if music is free for downloading, the music industry is not viable. All the jobs I just talked about will be lost and the diverse voices of the artists will disappear. The argument I hear a lot, that music should be free, must then mean that musicians should work for free. Nobody else works for free, why should musicians? In economic terms, music is referred to as intellectual property, as are films, television programs, books, computer software, video games, and the like. As a nation, the United States has excelled in the creation of intellectual property and collectively is this country's most valuable export. The backbone for the success of our intellectual property business is the protection that Congress has provided with the copyright statutes. No information-based industry can thrive without this protection. For instance, our current political dialogue with China is focused on how we must get 
how we must get that country to respect and enforce copyrights. How can we continue to take that position if we let our own copyright laws wither in the face of technology? Make no mistake about it, Metallica is not anti-technology. When we made our first album, most records were on vinyl. By the late 80s, cassette sales accounted for over 50% of the market. Now the compact disc dominates. If the next format is a form of downloading from the internet, with distribution and manufacturing savings passed on to the American consumer, then of course we will embrace that format. But how can we embrace a new format and sell our music for a fair price when somebody with a few lines of code, no investment costs, no creative input, and no marketing expenses simply gives it away. How does this square with the level playing field of the capitalist system? In Napster's brave new world, what free market economic model supports our ability to compete? The touted new paradigm that the internet gurus tell us we must adopt sounds to me like good old fashioned trafficking and stolen <laughs> goods. We have to find a way to welcome the technological advances and cost savings of the internet. However, this must be done without destroying the artistic diversity and the international success that has made our intellectual property industries the greatest in the world. Allowing our copyright protection to deteriorate is, in my view, bad policy, both economically and artistically. In closing, I'd like to underscore what I was spoken about today. I'd like to read from the terms of use section of the Napster Internet website. When you use Napster, you are basically agreeing to a contract that includes the following terms, and I quote, this website or any portion of this website may not be reproduced, duplicated, copied, sold, resold, or otherwise exploited for any commercial purpose that is not expressly permitted by Napster. All Napster website design, text, graphics, the selection and arrangement thereof, and all Napster software are copyright 1999-2000 Napster Inc. End quote. Napster itself wants and surely deserves copyright and trademark protection. Metallica and other creators of music and intellectual property want, deserve, and have a right to that same protection. Finally, I'd just like to read to you from a recent New York Times column by Edward Rothstein, and I quote, Information does not want to be free. Only the transmission of information wants to be free. Information like culture is the result of a labor and devotion, investment and risk. It has a value. And nothing will lead to a more deafening cultural silence than ignoring that value and celebrating companies like Napster running amok. Mr. Chairman, Senator Lee, the title of today's hearing asks the question, the future of the internet, is there an upside to downloading? My answer is yes. However, as I hope my remarks have made clear, this can only occur when artists' choices are respected and their creative efforts protected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ulrich. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. McGuinn, we'll take you at this time. Thank you, Senator. It's a pleasure to be here.